Hello and welcome back to all of you. I'm QSR Web and Pizza Marketplace editor Shelley Whitehead and so delighted that you've joined us today because we not only have something cool in the form of Dippin' Dots Chief Marketing and Sales Officer Michael Barrett and that frosty brand's latest news on the show, but also the head of the Interactive Customer Experience Association who will give us all the information we need for those many limited service brands who could be this year's winner at the Elevate Awards. That's all coming your way after this brief message. At the Restaurant Franchising and Innovation Summit, executives from leading brands will share their success stories of the numerous ways they have innovated to grow their franchises. Attendees will gain insight and inspiration to help them be more progressive in every facet of their businesses. Register today at FranchisingInnovation.com. Okay, now we're back and with us today is Interactive Customer Experience Association, or just ICX for short, and its managing director, Christopher Hall. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. My pleasure. And and Christopher not only runs the organization, but he kind of is instrumental in its seminal annual event, the ICX Summit, this year in early June in Dallas. And one of the really pivotal events at the ICX is the presentation of the Elevate Awards to those businesses that have really knocked customers' socks off when it comes to their brand experience. So first, Chris, can we start there? Since these awards are presented as part of the actual ICX Association Summit event in Dallas, please tell our listeners what that organization provides members and who goes to the annual summit and why. I Thank you. I'll be glad to. And so the ICX Summit is... And of course, I say this, and I'm I'm completely unbiased, but it is an amazing event that brings together leaders from across a variety of verticals, from retail to restaurant to hospitality, and uh, technology providers who connect them to the solutions that create amazing technological experiences for their customers. It's a great event for learning speakers, and the sessions are very educational. But just as important, I think, is the the networking and the, the hobnobbing, for lack of a better word, with fellow fellow thought leaders. I mean, you have the best of the best from really a plethora of verticals who are there to learn from each other, to teach each other, and to get to know each other. And it's really amazing to watch the cross pollination that happens from, say, retail to hospitality and restaurant to education. And the Elevate Awards really look to acknowledge those transcendent experiences that folks create in a variety of verticals. We have the best mobile interactive customer experience. We have the best retail interactive customer experience. And we have the best restaurant interactive customer experience. And we're really trying to find people that are leading the bleeding edge, as it were, of creating customer experiences that are transcendent and create lasting impression and engagement with consumers. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the past winners to give us an idea of what kinds of things are being recognized through these awards? Sure thing. And and I'm sorry, I wanted to back up a little bit too. One of the things that I think would really interest some of your listeners is that this is a, an event that brings in a lot of retail and a lot of other folks and tech folks, but the, the list of restaurants and leaders from restaurants who are speaking at the, at this event this year go from Fazoli's to Famous Dave's to, to Zeke's to A&W to Firehouse Subs. And then you add in people like Leo Burnett, NEC, Intel, T-Mobile, Caesars Entertainment, Under Armour, Best Buy. I mean, you really have a great opportunity to, to learn from folks. And and so, I'm sorry, then to ac- actually answer your question Some of our past winners have been Panera Bread. Um, We gave them our uh, ICX Influencer of the Year Award last year because they have been such a a leader in this space for several years. In fact, they were, uh, Blaine Hurst from Panera was the keynote speaker at our inaugural event. We have recognized McDonald's for uh, a virtual reality, augmented reality experience they did a couple of years ago that allowed customers to 
virtually join a NASCAR pit crew, for instance. Yeah. One of the other things we've acknowledged was the uh, Trek rider analysis kiosk that Trek Bicycles has rolled out, where they use a kiosk to help customers figure out the exact right bicycle for their body shape and their body size. Just really some amazing things that have allowed, again, brands to create transcendent experiences for their customers. For instance, Last year, uh, we acknowledged in the restaurant category a, a, a kiosk company, Zyvelo, uh, who has rolled out self-order kiosks in, well, I'm not allowed to say what the brands are, but <laughs> if you knew the brands, you would, you know the brands, and you see them every couple of miles when you drive through any major American city. So, mm. you know, it, it, it's people who roll out self-order kiosks at thousands and thousands of QSRs across the country. It's Dickie's Barbecue Pit, who last year won for basically transforming a, an Alexa into Dickie's Data Pit that allowed it to, that allowed store managers to access branch information at a voice command. So uh, it really does go all across various verticals. So. So I hope that gives some idea. It does. It, it, it really, um, by way of example, I think it probably describes as much as anything what specifically the organization is looking for in the nominees that will win, unless you have some other pointers. I will say this. I was trying to look at sort of what have been sort of the common themes and common threads amongst the Elevate Award winners. And I'll just say this, that there's not one thing. There is, it, it really boils down to when the judges look at the video or the photos that you sent, that you're, that the entries are sent, that the entrants send in, that we see an experience that blows customers away. And it can be much simpler than you think, like a writer analysis kiosk that does not take up a ton of space and does not have a ton of, say, virtual or augmented reality. Or it could be something that was amazing and brought in tens of thousands of people at uh, a, an augmented reality experience at the Super Bowl. So it literally can be something that's rolled out into every store across the country, or it can be one-off experiences that are amazing event pop-up kind of experiences so but it really is more about does it create an experience for your customers that is memorable and engaging you know and that's the thing about interactive uh customer experience it really does kind of grab you by the throat and say listen and look and some of the past winners that you've mentioned, just spectacular campaigns. You know, these these awards are, though, also uh, part of Dallas Summit. And I'm wondering, what are some of the things you're most excited about for this event coming up in June? Hard to sort of narrow it down sometimes. I always really do enjoy the awards event. I think that's a great opportunity because we turn it into kind of a party to be honest with you. And it's a great opportunity for these folks to get to know each other on a, on a pretty intimate level outside of the session sort of track kind of experience. But beyond that, you know, I would say one of the other things that's really interesting about this year's ICX Summit is that we're folding in the Connect Mobile Customer Experience Summit. So this is really going to be like two events in one. And the Interactive Customer Experience Summit has, and the Interactive Customer Experience Association, we've always folded in mobile because mobile is just another channel for creating experience and connection with your customers. But we've really sort of decided to go full force on that this year. And we've rolled these two events into each other together. And I think the event at the Omni Frisco Hotel in Dallas, it's a great venue. We're close to some really interesting things. And then, you know, the speakers are just out of this world. I mean, dominoes, is you know the director of digital delivery experience is, is going to be speaking the manager of mobile and digital innovation from caesar's entertainment you know, i mean it really just if you want to learn what is really the best way to reach out to your customers and like you say grab them by the throat and get to know them and get them to know you and build a relationship and build loyalty i, I don't think there's a better event out there for that um to be blunt um so 
So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think from owning the digital guest experience to augmented virtual and mixed reality in the real world to social and influencer marketing to how to succeed with mobile ordering. I mean, we're covering the gamut, to be sure, of ways to create customer experiences. So much to be learned. And, and, I, and I do like the, as you mentioned, the intimacy of the event. Well, and I think that's a great point. And thank you for bringing that up. Uh, we cap the attendance every year. And so you're exactly right. It is an intimate experience. It's usually, you know, a few hundred people at most. So it's not like going to one of the big shows at the Javits in New York City or the Las Vegas Convention Center where you're wandering through a show floor and bewildered and walking through a maze of technology. This is really an event where you are going to be sitting down for a couple of days with the same people and really having the opportunity to get to know each other. And that, I think, is one of the highlights or one of the strongest things about this this event. And I look forward to it every year. It's great because there are people who come back every year and you become friends and you work together. And then there are always fresh faces. So it's a great combination of of networking and, and meeting old meeting old friends and meeting new friends at the same time. Lots of fun. How, tell me again, how can a brand nominate themselves or someone else? Well, thank you for asking. So, yes, you would just go to the ICX Association website, icxa.org. If you go on the More tab, there's an Elevate Awards tab. Uh, and so it's really icxa.org forward slash elevate hyphen awards forward slash. And, um, <laughs> Mouthful, huh? <laughs> yeah, maybe that's a little too detailed, but just go to icxa.org and look for Elevate Awards and the entry, you can enter through the website. And the deadline right now to submit nominations is March 31st. So get those nominations together and get them in. Uh, it's just exciting to think about some of the things coming your way. I, I want to thank you so much, Christopher, for taking time to come on today. To our listeners, hang on just a moment as we will be right back with Dip and Dot's Chief Marketing and Sales Officer, Michael Perez. Many of the fastest growing and most successful chains in the restaurant industry are embracing innovation throughout their operations. These forward-thinking brands are constantly looking for the next innovation. New technologies, new menu items, new marketing tactics, new training programs, etc. that will propel them to even greater heights. Come and learn these innovations at the Restaurant Franchising and Innovation Summit. Register today at FranchisingInnovation.com. Welcome back. And now ponder this question. You're a youngster at an amusement park or ball game on a boiling hot summer day. You want something cold and sweet. What do you look for? Well, if you're like millions of kids, not to mention their paying parents who probably were also raised on them, you look for those pretty pastel colors of the dip and Dots franchise. That's right. The Paducah, Kentucky-based brand that parented the so-called ice cream of the future is with us today in the form of the brand's chief marketing and sales officer, Michael Barrett. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much, Shelley. It's a pleasure to meet you, and I appreciate you having interest in Dippin' Dots. Of course. Let me ask you. Can you first kind of give us a brief snapshot of the brand? It's 31 now, or almost 31, uh, including things like store count, your current retail products, and your global reach with Dippin' and Dots. Absolutely. And yes, we've become 30 years, 31 years young, excuse me, this coming end of March. So you're exactly right. In terms of uh, size of reach, I'll start with the franchising part of our business. That's a very important part of our business. And we actually have two legs to that stool now because we, all, we also acquired another company called Doc Popcorn about four and a half years ago. And I'll talk about co-brands here just in a minute. But we have a 117 franchise locations in the United States for Dippin' Dots. And we have 55 Doc Popcorn locations in the U.S. And between those two groups, we have 23 locations that are now co-brand selling both Dippin' Dots ice cream and the Doc Popcorn product. Now, outside of franchising, we, of course, do business with many other what we would call direct accounts. So those would be your typical 
uh, amusement parks and water parks and zoos and museums and aquariums and colleges. We have about 1,500, 1,500 of those. And then also when you talk about retail, we primarily have been a food service oriented company, but we have with our franchisee partners moved into gently convenience stores with our specialty minus 40 degree freezers uh, along with some grocery stores. And so between who our franchisees supply to and who we ship to direct, that's about 12,000 locations or what we call points of presence. We also, by the way, uh, lastly, have more recently with our franchisees gotten into the school space with K through 12 public schools. And so our franchisees are also the purveyors for product to about 300 or so uh, K through 12 schools with some special product we made that are kind of a snack, smart snack friendly for the school space. Wow. I wish I went to school now again. <laughs> <laughs> now, flavor variation is a big claim to fame for the ice cream of the future. So what role does flavor development really play in the brand's overall success? Well, flavor is very important because we have to keep our, our brand fresh. I will tell you that in terms of the number of flavors we have, we have kind of our scooped uh, product that people scoop at these various locations, whether it's a franchisee mall location or at a theme park, etc. We have about 25 of those flavors right now. That number does change uh, from year to year. We also have grab and go uh, packs. So we have what we call pre-packs. They look like little foil pouches, kind of like Capri Suns. We have 14 of those flavors. And then we also have like a grab and go spoon and lid cup. And we have seven of those flavors. So what we look to do is keep the um, range very fresh. We typically launch uh, one new scooping flavor uh, at least every two years. We also have some uh, limited time only flavors that we introduce, like for example, in the fall, we have pumpkin uh, spice pie, which is a limited time only flavor we bring out uh, a few months of the year. Um, we also uh, will bring out um, flavors depending on certain channel or vertical specific. So for example, I mentioned schools, we created a range of smart snack approved yogurt product. We call them Yo Dots. And so for example, this past year, we launched another Yo Dot flavor, which is a rainbow yogurt. And lastly, I'll just say in terms of keeping the, the, the whole feeling of our flavors very fresh, uh, this past year having been our 30th anniversary, we created kind of a fun 30th anniversary flavor, which was um, supported by a new mascot we created, which is a Yeti. And that Yeti actually has a name. It's Frozetti <laughs> the Yeti that we came up with with a nice consumer engagement kind of a contest. And so we launched a flavor called Frozetti Confetti, which is a very refreshing lemon ice and blue raspberry ice with a multicolored popping candy. So that's one of the things that we launched in 2018. And I think we shipped you some products for our very latest flavor edition, which we can talk about, which we're coming out with now for 2019. Yes, indeed. Mint chocolate chip, delish, wonderful all around by the folks at the office. <laughs> yes, yes. Actually, I think the official name is Cool Mint Crunch. And one of the things that we do when we get involved in sort of flavor work is, of course, it has to be outstanding flavor. But, you know, we also talk about mouthfeel. And one of the things I think when you look at what goes on in, you know, cooking shows on the Food Channel, you'll hear like those very chefy type comments, whether it's on Chopped or others, that they talk about texture. And so we introduced the number one selling cookie in the world, which is Oreo, into the Cool Mint Crunch. So not only getting the cool, refreshing mint flavor, you're getting that nice crunch from the Oreo cookie. Oh, gosh. We'll take a break just to go and dive into some. That sounds really good. You should. How, how do you even begin the process of developing new flavors? Where's that start? Sure. It's a multi-pronged approach, to be quite honest with you. First of all, we work very closely in marketing with our uh, partners in research and development who have uh, excellent relationships with the various upstream suppliers in the flavor industry. We would call those flavor houses. We also study uh, industry uh, with uh, professional journals, whether it's in the Dairy Association and other in the food and snacking industry to see what is on trend, what's on point. We do also look at the marketplace. We get input from our field based folks uh, who are representing the input from customers. We study train trends in the retail grocery industry as well. So for example, uh, we launched about 10 years ago a flavor called birthday cake and birthday cake was starting to become a thing in the grocery channel. So that was sort of um, 
a nod to what we were seeing there. At the end of the day, the most important litmus test for success is does it taste great and does it taste great with our core demographic, which essentially are kids 8 to 18 years of age. That's our primary bullseye. And um, if it doesn't pass muster with them, we may think it's a great flavor. We just don't, we don't have it. But as a consequence, we do engage with K through 12 students. We do uh, with R&D and marketing collaborating together uh, in school taste tests with multiple flavors to kind of uh, get the feedback and also kind of force rank what's the best of the best. And that has helped us to launch flavors in recent times. Um, we talked about Frozetti Confetti. Uh, prior to that, we launched a flavor called Brownie Batter. And then for 2019, uh, Cool Mint Crunch. So all of those have gone through that process, including having uh, been taste tested by kids. So you're taking them to high schools? Did I read that somewhere? Through uh, K through five, middle school, and also high schools. And one thing you may notice with consumers, some high school kids get to a place where they're like too cool for school and nothing gets them too sort of very sort of motivated. I can assure you humbly that when Dippin' Dots comes to their school to do some taste testing, even the too cool for school kids, they're all about it. They love it. Let me try those dots. I need to have a taste. I would love to get to hear some of the feedback you get, quite frankly. <laughs> it must be amusing at times. It can be, but it's also insightful. But the nice thing is, you know, like all, all good companies and all the companies that, that you work with in, in your kind of broadcast career, now we make great tasting products. So it's just a question of which one kind of edges out number two or number three. Well, you know, now I, I'm reading the worldwide expansion is starting to be a, a thing for you all. How do you predict flavor successes in global markets and do they do they differ in different countries? Well, Shelley, you're exactly right. Uh, we are, in fact, in nine countries presently outside the United States. We've had had more expansion in recent times in Asia, uh, specifically China, but we have been in South Korea for many years. And what we do is we work with our partners to obtain those consumer insights. So think global, but still act local. So our uh, manufacturing partner in South Korea, who also supplies for us Japan, um, Vietnam, Taiwan, will provide us input. As an example, we've got two flavors that we sell uh, in that market that we don't sell in the United States. One's called Apple Yo-Yo, which is like a sour apple sort of flavor. And the other is something called Honey Pink Blue, which is kind of like a cotton candy. And then beyond flavors, there's also the way products are named. So I mentioned cotton candy a moment ago. So in Australia, where we do business, cotton candy is called Fairy Floss. And I'll give you one other fun fact while we're talking about funny names. So my, uh, I told you my background is originally from Canada. And so cotton candy in French, because all of our packaging in Canada has to be English and French, is called barbe de papa, which literally means papa's beard. And that's how they call cotton candy up there. So it's kind of fun to see flavor differences, but also how products are, are described. Yeah, that's a, that's a big thing. And you can go terribly wrong, too, can't you, with, with that? Yes, you can. If you, yeah. I have two quick last questions for you. First is, can you give us some hints about where the brand's headed in the year ahead? And then second, what's your favorite Dippin' Dots flavor? Well, I'll answer maybe the second question first. I think my new favorite actually is the, the Cool Mint Crunch. And the thing I love about that flavor is when we're looking for new things, yes, we want to focus on our core with respect to, you know, the kids eight to 18 years of age, but also since our brand's now been around 31 years, folks who were kids 16, 17, 18, 19 years ago are now in their late 20s, early 30s, and they're having their kids and they're they're still loving the product. So uh, a, a flavor like Cool Mint Crunch kind of bridges the kids and parents, you know, kind of a shared pref preference. And I would say to you, think of something like um, a thin, uh, thin mint flavor from Girl Scout cookies. That would be an example of something that bridges the, the different generations. But in terms of, you know, you know where we're going, we really do want to continue to focus on working with our franchisees. So I talked about co-brand locations. We've got 23 now. We want to increase that by easily another 25, 30% in the upcoming 12 to 24 months. We want to continue to grow fairs and festivals. Our brand does very well in environments where people are having fun. We want to branch more into the 
what we'd call the Halloween haunted experiences and the Halloween mazes. We're going to actually to a, a trade show that just specializes in the Halloween business for people who do that this coming first quarter. Uh, also schools I mentioned we want to continue to grow. Uh, wholesale uh, distribution for franchisees where we allow them to be participating in the distribution of our grab and go uh, pre-packs I, I mentioned earlier uh, in select convenience stores. And the last thing I think we look for as one of the uncertainties in our business is whether we are a fairly weather dependent uh, industry. So we continue to look for, you know, where is there emerging growth that is less weather dependent? And one of those areas has been the indoor trampoline parks. Uh, they've exploded, as we all know, in the last probably half a dozen years and continue to do so. So that's an area where we are experiencing growth. Yeah, and you work up some heat doing that. I, the kids do, I would imagine, and they come come equipped with great appetites for Dippin' Dots. It yeah. all it right. all sounds delicious, Michael. I appreciate it so much you coming by to talk to us, tell us a little bit about the flavor development, and we all look forward at least here in the snowy Midwest uh, to summertime when we can really dig in deep to the Dippin' Dots. I appreciate it. Thanks well, thank so much for stopping by. Uh, well, thank you so much Shelley, for having me on again. You do a great job, by the way. Keep up the awesome work, and it's been a pleasure to chat with you today about Dippin' Dots. We really appreciate it. Now, to our wonderful listeners, take a moment to mark your calendars to return here next Friday for the QSR Web Podcast when Churches and Texas Chicken CEO Joe Christina stops in to talk about blazing a spicy Texas trail overseas while keeping things fresh and increasingly available on the U.S. front. Until then, I wish you great business in the week ahead. Take care.